Hello again. Um, this is our fourth and final panel for today. Um, I'll give it about a minute to let the technology work itself out uh, so people can get settled into the room uh, and settled into their seats as well. Uh, after about a minute, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, our last set of panelists. We have a exciting final panel uh, to end the day with. So I will circle back in now roughly 30 seconds. Okay, so we are all here now for our fourth and final panel. Uh, thank you all uh, for sticking it out with us. Uh, we started the morning off, uh, on the West Coast at least, the morning, uh, talking about the legal uh, challenges and opportunities when it comes to protecting climate displaced persons. Our legal scholar panel discussed some of the existing tools at the administration's uh, uh, disposal for protecting uh, climate displaced persons, things like TPS, DED. And we also talked about the creation of a humanitarian visa to protect climate displaced persons. That segued into a conversation with a couple of legislative offices about legislation uh, to protect climate displaced persons. Uh, and some of the challenges there. Uh, we then uh, talked about polling and messaging around climate-induced displacement. Uh, we called today a mini-conference, but a strategic mini-conference, because this is a issue that, as many have said uh, today, is going to be one of the sort of new frontiers in global migration and how any change uh, uh, when it comes to the protection regime for climate displaced persons will be transformative and potentially legacy making or breaking for decision makers. Uh, our roadmap gets us from what the opportunities are to what the challenges are to how we might think about uh, you know, creating a vocabulary to talk about the issues in order to help inform a broader campaign to now our concluding panel to hear from organizations who are in the trenches doing this work, um, what they're currently doing, the challenges that they're facing, uh, how we might plug in and what the future might hold. So without further ado, let me introduce our amazing lineup uh, and I'll go in alphabetical order. First, we have Denise Bell, researcher for refugee and migrant rights. Uh, previously senior campaigner for refugee and migrant rights, leading implementation of Amnesty International's welcome campaign on refugee rights. She came to Amnesty International from the US Department of Justice, where she was an attorney advisor on the New York Immigration Court. We also have Alma Francis, a climate displacement project strategist at the International Refugee Assistance Project, IRAP where they are tasked with developing the organization's strategy in collaboration with the Natural Resources Defense Council on expanding legal protection for climate displaced people. We also have Kaylee Ober, who is the Senior Advocate and Program Manager for the Climate Displacement Program at Refugees International. She also currently serves as a steering group member of the Climate Migration and Displacement Platform, uh, which is a global network of practitioners and advocates with a common concern for climate justice and the human rights of migrants. Uh, thus far today, we have had uh, candid, informal conversations uh, to sort of kick us off. And I hope that this is going to be a similarly candid and informal conversation. Um, I have a set of questions for each of you all to answer, and so we will just go in alphabetical order one question at a time. Uh, and definitely, if you have more interesting things to say than the question provides space for, then definitely feel free to uh, steer us in any direction you think might be helpful to end our day. 
Um, so the first question uh, for Denise is to tell us about the advocacy that Amnesty International is currently engaged in when it comes to better protecting climate displaced persons. And really to get into some of those pressing challenges uh, that uh, Amnesty International faces moving forward. Uh, thank you, Tom. And it's really awesome to be here and to see familiar faces that I've been working closely with. Um, and we just spoke together there at the NIC um, recently in Las Vegas. Um, so for Amnesty's perspective in terms of the US government, we really are seeking to engage the administration around several areas, um, including um, TPS, temporary protected status, to make sure that it is implemented in a way that is inclusive of people who have been affected by climate, um, climate changes. And so, for example, specifically with the Central American countries, TPS should be reissued or stated, or excuse me, implemented, des designated for these countries um, so that people are not forcibly returned to harm. Uh, because we do see that um, in terms of climate displacement and climate um, change uh, impacts, that this really does trigger several human rights obligations around refoulement, so people are not returned to a place where they could be harmed, and also the right to seek asylum. TPS falls very much in the refoulement um, camp, and so we want the government to use temporary protected status and defer, um, deferred enforcement departure, DED, as um, um, robustly as possible. Um, these are mechanisms that we have in our toolbox right now that we can use. And often I think um, governments will stop and think we have to build new policy solutions. Well, you, we don't, we have some right now while we build additional channels for longer term solutions. Another, um, and so we are working with the government right now um, and some of us here will um, be um, invited to the stakeholder call with um, Department of Homeland Security around engagement around these issues. Another channel that we're really looking to um, develop further in advocacy is with the department, um, with the administration around how do we incorporate standards such that the UN Refugee Agency is developing that show that people affected by climate change or climate impacts can qualify for refugee status. This is not asking to reopen the Refugee Convention. It is not asking to rewrite the definition of refugee, but it's recognizing that people can fall with under, fall within the category of refugee persecuted on one of five um, protected grounds because of climate change impacts. So those are two main streams that we are looking at right now. Excellent, thank you for that. And when it comes to the use of TPS and DED, uh, certainly tools at the administration's disposal uh, right now. Um, but what kind of challenges uh, uh, you know, have you faced and Amnesty International faced in terms of getting the administration to kind of move from, let's uh, have an executive order that states uh, explicitly a relationship between climate change and migration to the report released recently, uh, that adds more flesh uh, to the importance of uh, this nexus to now taking action. So what are some of the challenges there? What are some of the opportunities also? Well, I think there are two, and I'm so glad you brought this up because I think many people look at this or many people in the administration uh, look at this as you're opening up the Pandora's box. Oh my gosh, how many people around the world have been affected by climate change? You're asking us to give everyone protection. No, what we're saying is that you have to have a multi-pronged approach to this and to recognize that migration is adaptation, but also that just because people move doesn't mean that they don't still carry their rights with them. And some people may settle in a third country. So we need to make sure that internally displaced programs are staffed, are developed, are funded, but also People still inherently, it's a universal right, the right to seek asylum, but everybody also has, this is non-derogable. People cannot be returned to a place where they can seek harm. So the, first of all, let's address how they don't have to flee in the first place, or if they do leave, that they can live with dignity and support where they are. 
Um, but what I find here, um, I think that many of us encounter the same challenges around uh, immigration writ large, is that there is a con there is a political calculus. Are we doing too much that might um, undermine uh, other agendas, or um, not actually quite understanding that Central America, that it's very mixed the um, the flows of migration, and that climate displacement is one part of that and there are rights inherent to that and that we have tools to address that. I would also like to say about Central America because this in the, from a US perspective, this is often where we focus. Um, most people internally, they go from one location to another until they can't stay. And also they can't stay because they've been persecuted because of their climate advocacy or for other relief reasons related to it. So again, the best solution is always to make sure that people can stay where they are if they so choose and live with dignity and resources to support themselves. And then if they are compelled to cross a border, that we support them where they are. Thank you for that, Denise. So I'll move to Ama. So same question. Can you tell us a little bit about what IRAP is currently doing? and what some of the sort of challenges that you're currently facing. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tom. Um, and again, it's a pleasure to be here. So for those um, of you all who don't know who IRAP is, IRAP is an organization that works to enforce the rights of refugees and displaced people, um, direct legal services, litigation, and also advocacy. And we launched our climate program earlier this year um, with the goal, as you said, Tom, of expanding legal protection for climate displaced people. And we see that work as important because there's really limited law, as this conference has outlined, I think, very clearly um, to protect climate displaced people. There are multilateral treaties um, that comprehensively address climate displacement. And on the domestic level, um, there aren't any domestic laws anywhere in the world that, that really focus in on protecting climate displaced people. And so if you're a person who is forced um, to move across a border, for example, um, this leaves you in a hugely vulnerable situation. So um, IRAP's work, our, our climate program really is about cracking this legal nut um, in partnership with other advocates, um, in partnership with affected communities. And I'll just highlight two things um, we've worked on recently. So one is um, a report with a set of recommendations for the Biden administration on concrete next steps the Biden administration can take right now. I think that's been a really clear point throughout this strategy conference. There are things that the Biden administration could do tomorrow, um, could even do this afternoon um, to protect climate displaced people. And that's an important first step. Um, Besides the, the report, um, we've also convened, um, we hosted a three-part convening earlier this year, along with ACLU and 350.org to help support this growing ecosystem of advocates and other actors who are really engaged on this issue um, and really learning um, from, from others who've been in this space much longer than us, like Refugees International, shout out to Kaylee. Um, so I think one of our challenges is that Sometimes I think this issue gets framed as a very far off one, um, something that will happen in the future and therefore steps right now aren't as pressing or important. But we know that climate is already a lead driver of displacement. Um, climate and other environmental disasters are displacing about three times the number of people than conflict and violence within their own countries. And some people are moving across borders, but our laws aren't where they need to be and we need protection right now. So this isn't some future issue. This is a right now issue. Great, thanks so much for that. Uh, one of the points made in our first uh, panel with our legal scholars is that the current protection regime doesn't reflect the realities of current global migration. And I think that mismatch is something that is both challenging, but also the opportunity that I think uh, we all kind of see um, moving forward. Um, so Kaylee, same question to you about what Refugees International uh, is currently doing and uh, some of the challenges that you're facing. 
Thanks, Tom. Thanks for inviting me and happy to be here along with Alma and Denise. Um, so Refugees International uh, has established the climate displacement program for over a decade, as Alma mentioned. So uh, typically what we've been working on is amassing a body of knowledge um, about climate change and displacement issues. Uh, we're one of the only organizations that goes to a post-disaster uh, situation to talk with IDPs uh, to lift up kind of policy recommendations around this sort of disaster displacement. Um, you know, lately and luckily, we've been engaging a lot more on the domestic front because the Biden administration, you know, released that executive order in February about climate change and migration, which was groundbreaking at the time. And then, of course, just last week released their um, official report to, from the NSC on this issue. Uh, and so we have been taking a very, you know, broad approach to this, diverse approach to this, because we recognize that climate change and migration is a very complex issue. Um, it's two, we, so we're focusing on two broad buckets of work. One is around prevention. So ensuring that those who um, may be impacted by climate change are able to stay in places where they're from if they would like to do so. And that's through a variety of ways, including mobilizing financing for climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction, including ensuring it is um, mobilized to those who are most in situations of vulnerability, right? Or most at risk to, to climate changes, uh, especially local communities and, and kind of holding up um, the agenda around humanitarian localization, right? Um, another is talking about prevention, this bucket of work about prevention, I'm, I'm sorry, protection, as Amma and Denise have been talking about, and recognizing that protection means much more than just international protection, right? So I think we're very much attuned to the question of international protection, um, and it definitely receives a lot of focus and play, not from just advocates, but also uh, the media. But you know, coming in eyes wide open, there's other avenues that perhaps are not as sexy. And this is kind of the challenge as well, right? There are avenues that are not as sexy that might be more impactful, including supporting um, you know, internal displacement policy implementation, mobilizing resources to it, much like the high-level panel on internal displacement discussed. Um, you know, even getting into kind of techn techn bureaucratic fixes. So referencing what Denise and Amo were saying before about mobilizing. Um, you know, uh, guidance memoranda around um, mainstreaming UNHCR guidance around, um, you know, protection in the context of climate change and disaster, um, you know, utilizing immigration policy in different regions of the world that actually look at this much more than the U.S. and supporting regional approaches to this. So it's a whole wider range of issues um, that RI is interested in, um, and I think we'll be getting in a little bit deeper with the rest of the panel on, on futures. Great, thank you for that. Um, and I think that's a good segue to the next question because when we think about the work to be done, uh, we can imagine, uh, and I think the, 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 the next question is, is, is worded poorly because my answer would be all of the above, but we can imagine, you know, comm strategy, legislative strategy, administrative strategy, even litigation strategies. So the question, as we previously wrote it, uh, uh, and we'll start with Denise again, is what are the best avenues, comms, legislative, administrative, for advocating for climate displaced persons? But uh, assuming some kind of answer of all of the above, uh, maybe we can also think about uh, in which sort of areas is there more work needed or more support needed? Um, because I can imagine like on the comms front, uh, maybe some of that public opinion research is just lacking. Um, or on the legislative front, what Jonathan from Rep Velasquez's office mentioned was a kind of desire for more quantitative data. Um, so Denise, go ahead and kick us off. Um, Tom, thank you. I think you answered the question. You said everything I would say. <laughs> so we need all of the above. Um, but where I think the easier way is like, where can we start to build out deficits, right? Um, to make sure that we can make a stronger argument um, and more persuasive argument um, for Congress, the administration and the public. So one, I do think it is a public interest research um, so that we understand how to communicate this more clearly that it is a solvable problem. Well, first of all, it's not a problem, it's people's lives, but it's a solvable um, situation that we're all facing. And again, I think just like with refugees and asylum seekers, people seeking safety, um, 
but for the grace of God or circumstance, it could be us. And in fact, we're seeing it in the United States, right? And I think that is very frankly, one thing that many of us shy away from um, because of the political nature, the contentiousness in the US for um, US audiences. Uh, climate change is about something over there. It's not here. It doesn't have to do with the floods and the fires here or that the ocean is on fire. That's something else. It's not us. The United States can handle this. So I think that um, how do we um, message test this? How do we find out people's concerns? How do we start to connect the dots so that people don't feel threatened in the United States that climate change is happening here? So it's for everybody's benefit, um, but it's also solvable. It's also solvable and that it fits in frameworks that we understand already, whether it's the policy tools we've discussed, um, or um, these ideas of the right to seek asylum or reform. So definitely we need comms development, um, research and strategy, but we also just need research because these are the questions we're asked again and again, particularly, um, yes, by people in the administration, but also by Congress. What is the number, what are the numbers? What are we talking about? Um, Senator Markey and Representative Velasquez have this great bill but even as advocates, we are trying to come up with solutions and plug in numbers there. Is 50,000 enough? If we want a climate humanitarian visa, how many people will be affected? That's just the nature of rulemaking. So we do need a little bit more research around that, that will help both with messaging, but then I think particularly legislative solutions, because those would be the harder ones to move through. Um, so. I would start there with those about how are we going to message this, what resonates, and what is some quantifiable data that we can use. Great. Uh, if I can just follow up, Denise, um, and others feel free to weigh in as well. Um, Denise, I, I, I heard you say problem and then catch that. And then it, it just sort of in me, um, you know, my social science research sort of brain kicks in in terms of uh, message testing and randomizing how we describe the issue. Um, now, sort of couple in people's imagination, at least some people's imagination, that this is a problem and potentially a threat. The recent White House report talks about the interagency working group as being housed within the National Security Council. So when we think about those two things coupled together, American public opinion may view this as threatening, and then the US government addressing the issue through a national security lens. How does that affect your advocacy? How does that affect the conversations that you're having, whether it be with the public, whether it be with members of Congress? Um, how do we potentially reframe if we do want to reframe this away from a sort of, you know, quote unquote problem or a security threat? Um, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, the link that I dropped into the chat, this is Amnesty's briefing that um, we did. It talks exactly about this. If we only approach this, we as a people, we as a government, the United States government, as a national security issue, we will never ever address the root causes of migration or, or the humanity that's involved. We will be on a continual loop as we already see because the fact of life, people will leave, they will migrate in response to different threats to their well-being. Um, but also nobody wants to leave home if they don't have to leave home. And so if we only see things as a threat and a challenge, we'll never actually solve the problem. But how do we address this? Human-centered narrative, values-based narrative. I think that we need to be very clear that this affects everybody that this affects our universal values. This also reflects of how we see ourselves as a country, which is a beacon of hope and a beacon of safety. And that we want to continue to leave, live by those values that we believe that we have and implement them in our policy. There's no reason not to here. So a lot of it is going back to human-centered values-based messaging. Um, that's very hard here because as you, so the national security narrative has been the predominant one for a number of years. So we have work to do here around that. And that's where the message testing will be really important, I think. But also the storytelling. This is what I do as a researcher. 
which is why I said problem, because I think in problem sets, but I'm like, oh, that's different than public messaging. <laughs> um, as a researcher, we need to talk to people and get their stories. How is this affecting you? Why did you leave? Did you want to leave? What are your hopes for the future? So people see that this is another person just like us. And I also think it's really important, like when I talk in the United States, when um, early on a few years ago, I talked about trying to explain internally displaced person and a refugee, I would refer to the floods in North Carolina and how nobody wanted to leave, even though the water was up to the roof and they were sitting on the eaves. Nobody wanted to leave. And as soon as that water went down, they returned because that's who we all are. And so people who are forced to flee, who can't return, they're us, but just crossing a boundary. Thanks for that, Denise. Ama and Kaylee, did you want to weigh in at all? Yeah, I'll jump in on the security question. Um, I think there's like one way in which the security framing kind of really torn internally about this, but I think there's a way that the reason that part of why I think climate displacement is getting some attention right now is because security actors who are well resourced are, are motivated by it. Um, that being said, um, I completely agree with Denise that, that we need to be centering human narratives um, and making it really clear that climate change is the security threat, not climate migrants. I think too often um, in the framing of these issues, you know, we get these projections about millions and billions of climate migrants flooding the US and, and that's, you know, both played on by people with xenophobic agendas, but also people with more well-meaning climate ambition agendas who use this idea of migration as a way to say we should be doing more on the mitigation front. We should be doing more to cut carbon pollution so that we don't have these people arriving at our shores. Um, and I think on both sides of the aisle, what that's missing is the fact that migration is a valid adaptation strategy. People have been moving in response to environmental change for, for as long as humans have been around. It's a really natural strategy and response. And the problem is not that people are moving, it's that our laws aren't set up to protect people and make sure that people can move in a dignified way. Um, so I would say that, and I just wanna to point to some great work that 350.org and GSCC Network have done on this framing and, and security question, and that might be, that's been a resource for me and might be a resource for other folks. Thanks, Ama. Uh, Kaylee, I don't want to put you on the spot if uh, you don't. Uh... Oh, it's, I'm perfectly fine to talk a little bit about this. I think we absolutely need, um, I actually do, unlike Denise, think there is a lot of research. Um, there's just not a lot of political will. And I think that um, we must be careful about the quantifying numbers game because it's often used and misused by those very actors that Amo was speaking about, right? So talking about mass migration, inundation of the border, um, othering of migrants, um, using climate change as uh, sort of a blanket, um, you know, driving factor from the global south to the global north, right? Um, so just one pin on that. Um, but secondly, we, we uh, absolutely need legislative um, agendas um, because without it, we won't have kind of these more broad protection standards. So Denise is talking about um, both revisions to TPS or expanding TPS that requires legislative intervention to some degree. Um, likewise, if we're talking about some sort of complementary protection standard, right? So um, and essentially enabling people to apply for asylum um, if they face um, risk or injury, uh, especially due to climate change, for instance, uh, if they were to re be returned home. So a different sort of complementary protection um, or an additional one than we currently have, then we need legislation. At the same time, it's the most challenging thing that we could possibly do. I mean, even in this in this conference, who are the people, who are the who are the legislative actors that are taking, um, you know, uh, taking advantage of this conference who are interested in this topic? The, those are um, actors that are already aligned with us, right? So who are those persuadable legislative actors that we need to reach out to or to, to be, um, you know, enmeshed in this agenda? It can't just be kind of in this bubble. Um, and, you know, if 
our current immigration laws are any indication, we're not going in a more progressive direction necessarily. And if we can't do our basic due diligence around our current immigration laws, how are we going to expand it, especially in a legislative manner? So although I believe the legislative path is the most fruitful, um, you know, administrative can get some things done right away. Um, and hopefully we can lean a little bit into that as well as advocates. Yeah, thank you for that. As, as, as you know, my social science hat is back on again. Uh, a lot of political scientists will send surveys to decision makers. So members of Congress uh, often get surveys from political scientists. I think uh, I would be incredibly curious about whether or not certain members whose own districts have experienced climate disasters, uh, like Denise mentioned in North Carolina with flooding, uh, have uh, climate induced displacements on their minds at all, or if knowledge of things like flooding in your own district uh, can actually generate more uh, uh, sort of care and attention from that member uh, to get some of those persuadables to actually be part of the uh, tent. Um, uh, but this is what today has been about. It's to sort of think about uh, the interplay between advocacy, advocacy and research, um, among other things. But Ama, I wanted to circle back to you. I think what you said in terms of you know climate change being the threat, not uh, climate migrants, uh, is 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 an important one for people to take away. But did you want to add anything else to that question about sort of the best avenues, comms, legislative, administrative, uh, for moving our advocacy forward? Yeah, I think they're all. Thanks, Tom. I think they're all really important. Um, and I think Denise and Kaylee have covered a lot of this. And I just wanted to circle back and emphasize that there is, um, there are things that we can be doing administratively without Congress right now. And some of this we've already talked about. Um, but the report following UNHCR guidance, um, clearly the, sorry, the Biden interagency report that just came out very clearly recognizes that climate displaced people can have valid claims for refugee status following UN guidelines. And something that the Biden administration could do to operationalize that recognition in the report would be to train our asylum and refugee officers on climate change, for example. Um, and that's something that wouldn't need congressional support. So there are things, I think, sort of there's an administrative opportunity we have here as advocates following the interagency report that it's really important to seize upon. Um, but of course, legislative um, advocacy is really important. I think the climate humanitarian visa that was proposed by Senator Markey and Congresswoman Velasquez has been discussed at length um, in this conference happily. Um, and so there are proposals on the table. And I just want to pick up Kaylee's point that we have um, I don't want to say we have all the answers, but we have solutions. That's that's not the problem. The problem is the political will to actually implement those things. Um, so, so I think that's why the comms piece is actually really important. And I appreciate the work that your center is doing, Tom, to try to figure out how do we galvanize the public around this issue? Um, and I think your, your question about whether representatives in, in Louisiana or places that are experiencing flooding um, might be motivated on this issue um, is a really good one. Um, because I think we're climate migration, we're sort of uniquely positioned in terms of an immigration issue where this is affecting people domestically and it's affecting people abroad. And I think that's that's really an opportunity for solidarity and, and, and cross-border transnational movement, um, which would be really important to actually pushing government officials to implement the solutions that we're talking about today. Awesome, thanks for that, Alma. Kaylee, I wanted to sort of follow up on something you said and, and Alma also noted. Uh, this is the first time uh, during today that we've uh, talked about political will at all, because maybe it's because we had a couple of offices participate who are already sympathetic, right? So uh, to the point that you made earlier, but where where do you see the lack of political will? I mean, is, is, it, is it a partisan divide? Is it a climate denier divide? Um, and then on the flip side of that, where do you think we can generate some political will? Where, who are the persuadables that we might be able to target with our research, our advocacy, this sort of multi-pronged strategy that we're trying to develop here? 
yeah, um, that's a perennial question, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> so um, forgive me, but th there was a lot to that question and I'll, I'll focus on this. I'm not quite sure who the persuadables are in Congress at the moment. I think we, those who are most vocal about this subject are those who are already going to engage on it. Um, what's motivating most members from stepping into the fray is probably more immigration than climate change. Um, in fact, we've seen Republicans reference climate change and migration, but only to beef up security on the border, right? So it will be used in the way that um, different members want to use it. And um, I'm not exactly certain who the persuadables should be or could be, but obviously some work to be done uh, within this community um, and with your social science research. Okay, cool. So that 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 is something for the academics uh, who are on the Zoom and who are going to be uh, reviewing the recording. Uh, this is something for us to help figure out. We can do this for voters, or at least we try to do this for voters, or pretend that we can do this for voters. Uh, so some of us also focus on decision makers as well. Uh, so hopefully there will be more on that front. Um, but now kind of, you know, shifting gears a little bit. Uh, so thinking about just the audience uh, that's uh, currently here, uh, the audience that will be uh, watching the recording, um, how can people get plugged into the work that your respective organizations are doing? And we'll start again with you, Denise. Um, and then I'll kind of add uh, uh, an addendum to the question that was sent out, um, not just generally about how research can play a role, but what research projects specifically, if you have one in mind, do you think uh, uh, folks should be uh, taking on right now? So how can advocates or how can folks plug in and then what research should we be doing? Um, thank you, Tom. Right now, um, so Amnesty International is um, a grassroots membership organization and uh, the U.S. section, I represent the U.S. section, um, but we are global. Right now, um, a lot of our work around climate displacement is still in development in terms of public engagement. Um, just uh, at the end of um, May, um, we published the US section published for the first time ever country specific recommendations on how to, um, for the government uh, to approach uh, the climate change as a human rights issue. And then uh, the next month in June, we published for the first time ever um, a comprehensive human rights framework for um, looking at the climate um, crisis as a human rights crisis, as a human rights issue. And the reason that's important is that we're still building this out in terms of our membership engagement. But so what I encourage people to do is reach out to our campaign section and reach out to our advocacy sec section um, uh, to find out how to get plugged in because there will be opportunities for advocacy and there are always opportunities just generally around climate change for example we support the climate strikes we support uh, advocacy that's happening at the un level uh, but we are building out those um, access points for the grassroots membership in terms of a, a campaign um, what i liked is this question right here about um, thinking about foreign policy folks on the Hill as a third prong, I think that's really smart. Um, we need to start to engage that to, you know, Amma's point, like, yes, national security, but it also intersects with foreign policy. And how do we turn that narrative and how do we turn that discourse to our advantage? Because the fact is, there probably will be some implications, but that doesn't mean that they should be um, a barrier to achieving what we want, which is um, human rights protection for people who are affected by um, climate change. So I just like us to get thinking about how do we think about these, these unusual allies? Um, because I think we're all working toward the same goal, but perhaps using a different language. A yeah, quick follow up on those. Uh, so we, we in, in the sort of immigration literature, we would call them strange bedfellow coalitions, at least historically. Um, and, and I don't mean this to say that uh, uh, these are strange bedfellows at all, but I'm wondering what is your sense of how much alignment there is when it comes to immigrant rights and justice activists and uh, those who are, are advocating on climate change? Uh, is there 
are people playing well in the sandbox or have there been challenges to sort of address and overcome? Um, I guess that's for me, I'll take it. I, I think people have been playing well. It's, it's, just, it's learning um, the different tools in each of our toolboxes, so to speak. But what I've observed is like, oh, how are we learning together to amplify what we can do? Because we're talking about a very similar and overlapping population. Absolutely. Got it. And if there is a sort of a research wish list, do you have one for us, Denise? Again, I would go back to the human centered approach. We need more stories from the people who are living this and who are impacted to really help shape the narrative, help shape messaging and help shape our advocacy. Because in the end, I think it's Kayla, you said this, it's about political will. That's what this is about. And the more that we have stories, it actually, I mean, that's what Amnesty's research, we are obviously very human centered impact in what we do. But the research shows if you hear from the people most who are most affected, it actually helps to shape the narrative of what people will do or what they feel they can do. Yeah, I, I, I sorry to invoke my uh, moderator privileges uh, so much during this panel, more so than other panels. But I, I think it's actually important because this, this really is about sort of our collective next steps. Um, Jonathan from Velasquez's office, actually made a point to say that they have enough stories, that they have enough on the qualitative side. And what would help them the most is quantitative work. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how you interpret that, Denise, when you are making a pitch for, you know, centering, you know, the human beings who are affected um, and the stories that they have, the lives that, you know, they, 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 they are living. Uh, when you hear somebody, uh, 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 in an allied office, say we have enough of that. I mean, there. So what I would say is that are we using the stories? Or are we using the human voices in the most constructive way? Mm. Um, so that where we might need to be using them more is public messaging to re reach the people in the middle, truly in the middle of the country. But in terms of congressional advocacy with our allies, um, I would suggest that we need to be more strategic then in how we're using the stories, because again, it's value based arguments. The fact is, they feel that they need more data. And to Kaylee's point, and this is, we don't want the numbers to be used against us, but the fact is, there is a gap in knowledge. So we need to meet that gap. But as we found with the refugee, um, with the needs for a refugee resettlement, um, and forcibly displaced people. If you lead with a number of more than 80 million people in the world are displaced, people feel overwhelmed and they also lose the human side of it. So what you start is like, these are the people, these are the numbers and the scope of the issue behind us. And this is how we can help the individuals and address that, um, those numbers. Thanks for that, Denise. Kaylee, hop in. I wanted to play devil's advocate here because I'm truly interested in what congressional offices want, but what does he want the numbers for? Like, what would that motivate differently than what's being motivated now? Like, who would that persuade or, you know, what could be written in a different way if they had more numbers? That's, I think, a fundamental question, actually, because there are disparate numbers out there, actually, some of which are more accurate than others, not are completely accurate because it is for case forecast based, you know, it's in the future. Um, it's based on different models with different inputs. But, um, you know, if that's the kind of numbers he wants that exists, but what will those numbers be used for is the additional question to really understand what numbers are missing for, for that office. Now, that's a great point. And a little bit of context for those who are tuning in and for those who are going to listen in later. Um, in the social science literature, we have this issue of a numeracy when it comes to immigration in general. Once we start talking in terms of numbers, people uh, have a heightened sense of anxiety vis-a-vis -vis immigration, which then extends to uh, negative preferences over things like expanded visas, um, uh, even for humanitarian protection. So this problem of enumeracy is very front and center when it comes to climate-induced displacement, because as Kaylee mentioned, some of the estimates are high to a level where one can imagine being 
uh, or one can imagine having a conversation with average Joe or Jane public and them imagining an entire world on the move and potentially wanting to come to the United States. And so when a legislative office is asking for, well, what is the scale of the phenomenon so that we can write in our piece of legislation how many number of visas that we want to allocate? Like, that's a tricky dilemma because the scale is going to be large. We know not everybody is going to move, which is why we want to sort of, you know, uh, amplify the fact that a lot of this is going to be internal displacement. But once we give the number, how's that office going to use it? How's the other side going to use it? And if it ends up being a lose-lose, I think to Kaylee's point, do we potentially just shift away? And if so, what do we shift away to? So I think this is a, an example of where potentially research can be helpful, potentially research can uh, not add much to the conversation, um, but I think it's an open empirical question about how people interpret numbers, uh, how decision makers interpret numbers, but then ultimately how those numbers are used. I think that is for us collectively to worry about and uh, to try to kind of create safeguards around. Um, but a difficult nut to crack, uh, and I don't think we can do it in one session, um, but a conversation to, 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 to be continued. Um, so, so, so for Ama, uh, you know, same question about, you know, how folks can get plugged in uh, to the work that IRAP is doing and the advocacy uh, that IRAP is doing. Um, and then if there is a research uh, wish, uh, wish list that you have. Um, yeah, sure. Thanks, Tom. So if, if people are interested in um, getting plugged in, I think one of the best ways is to get involved in um, our convenings. Um, and you can reach out to me or find um, information about us on the IRAP website really easily. Um, but I'm more excited to talk about this, um, this question about a research wish list. Um, and I think this will connect back to some of the things that we're talking about. So something I think we say often as advocates um, and scientists is that the majority of climate migration is internal. And I'm going to be unpopular for saying this, but I don't know that we actually know that because we don't have any precise estimates of cross-border movement. Um, it's really difficult to track people when they move across borders, the same methods that we use the proxy methods, not to get too technical about this, are a little more difficult. It's just very simply, it's harder to track people if they're moving from country to country. And so we actually don't really know how many people are moving across borders. And the other, I mean, I think broadly speaking in the, in the research space, I would just, as, as it relates to climate displacement, I would love to see more that relates to justice. So another thing we say, um, so going back to this point of the majority of climate displacement being internal, being a person from the global south, I think part of the reason that is, is because it's incredibly difficult to migrate to the global north. It, it takes a huge amount of resources. Um, the most often people have to either make life-threatening journeys or, or they're coming from a background of privilege, which means that they can move from a country in the global south to the global north. So I have a question about whether people, if it was easier to migrate to the US, if that would be a, a route that people would prefer to take rather than to a city that was close by to their rural community, for example. And I just don't think that the, the research is attending to sort of the equity questions um, or some of the, the larger framing questions about how resources are playing into folks' choices and movement. Um, and then another thing um, going to the speaking to the same point about justice is that from the examples I've seen, it seems that the majority of people who are on the move in the context of climate are black, indigenous or people of color. Um, but again, we have no research to call it quantitative research to back that up. We know that indigenous communities in the US are on the move. We know that after Katrina, it was majority black people moving. We know that Central Americans, Latinx people are, are arriving at the Southern border because of climate related disasters. But we don't have actually any quantitative backing to the idea that, that black indigenous and people of color BIPOC are really the ones being affected by this issue. So I think social scientists honestly need to do a better job about centering equity as part of their research um, and the questions that they're asking. And I think that'll really shape the solutions that, that come to the fore. 
Uh, thank you so much for that. I, I, I do have a follow up that you may not have the answer to, but um, when, when I think about the intersection between climate change and migration, uh, this is new for political scientists. This is new for social science in general. And when we think about the sort of large literature on climate change, that's been mostly led by natural science, the natural sciences. Mm -hmm. And if we think about academia as being pale, male, and stale, it is especially true for the natural sciences, you know, compared to the social sciences, where at least we have, you know, ethnic studies departments and, and, and so on and so forth. And so I guess my question is, do you think the researchers are actually there? Do they exist who care about equity and justice, who are willing to center BIPOC communities in these conversations right now? Or is it an issue we got too many pale, male, and stale folks still in academia and have to wait for a next generation of scholars? I don't know if you've experienced that in your interactions at all. Well, I won't speak to that, but I, I, I don't think we have to, I don't think we have to wait. Um, I think that I, I think there are already researchers, especially if we open sort of our pool and frame of who, who valid researchers are. There are lots of researchers in the global south working on this issue. Um, and so I think part of the question is how can institutions in the US better partner with researchers from the global south, for example, so that um, we're, we're giving sort of matching resources and, and expertise um, and lived expertise um, across, across the board. Or So I guess just to, to simply answer your question, yes, I think the researchers are there, but I think we need to be relationship building a little better. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so Kaylee, for you, similar question or same question, it's how can folks get plugged in uh, to the work that you're doing and what that research wish list may be? Yeah, first I wanna say, I just wanna piggyback off of what Kama said a little bit, which is, you know, what are, what are the demographics of researchers that are putting out work on this? And, you know, a little a little bit in contention with what you said, there are some good social scientists working on this, um, you know, and some of the names might be familiar, you know, Neil Adger, Francois Jimin, um, Robert McLemon, uh, you know, th these are all white males. <laughs> there are also people in the Global South who are already working on this work too don't get as much recognition. So I just like to lift them up as well. So there's um, a lot of researchers in Bangladesh, for instance, Salim Hook, there's Tazneem Siddiqui, there is um, uh, also uh, Bishwad Malik, there is uh, Chani Singh in, in India, um, for instance. So South Asia is really well covered. There's some in Pacific um, and East Asia, including the Philippines. So Iban Su does work there, Tina Alvarado, um, and um, Tammy Tabe for instance. So there are those that are working there. They just don't get as much traction or recognition as they should. And perhaps some of the things that they're writing are a bit more controversial, right? Like anti-capitalist, um, anti-neoliberalism, things that we really need to get into to really tackle the roots of climate change, actually, and the need to migrate or inequities related to migration, right? Um, and so it, we're kind of talking in circles about small tweaks, but these are huge, huge issues that need to be addressed. Um, then when it comes to getting involved with our eyes work, uh, much like um, I encourage you to um, interface with our website, we hold events regularly, we publish blog posts, um, op-eds, um, reports that we would love to have disseminated and you read, and interacting in a setting like this is always super helpful. Um, and then my wish list is really uh, not is towards the not sexy part of my um, interjection earlier, which is understanding um, social practices around policy making and implementation of policy. So can we have some comparative case studies of places where there was good implementation of, for instance, the Kampala Convention, right? So IDP protection as it relates to climate change. Uh, in particular, specifically on climate change and disaster. Um, one, when does it become successful versus not? You know, getting into that kind of um, bureaucrats on the street sort of analysis. Um, that would be really interesting to me as someone who interacts with policymakers and needs to really understand um, how to get at what works for them, right? Um, and not just in a US context, but a global context. Yes, thank you all for 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 that. I think uh, 
getting out of a US centered framework is incredibly important. And uh, for those who are tuning in, there is a conversation in the panelist chat right now about creating a list of scholars from the global south who are working on these issues. And I think that um, is, is desperately needed um, and important. And so I just want to quickly recap where we've been and then to end by you know, thanking our panelists here. Uh, but again, we started off by having a scholar or having a panel of legal scholars talk to us about sort of existing uh, legal frameworks for better protecting uh, climate displaced persons and the sort of need for legislation to more permanently protect climate displaced persons. Uh, from there, we segued into a panel to talk about from the perspective of two legislative offices, legislative advocacy on climate displaced persons, uh, what some of the opportunities uh, and challenges uh, there were. That kind of helped us level set for thinking about how social science research can potentially play a role in uh, uh, you know, helping move advocacy forward. Uh, we heard about some public opinion work uh, that places climate change on par with other uh, protected categories. Uh, uh, for example, persecution because of political opinion, uh, where if an individual experiences that persecution, we do provide refuge, you know, with a lot of caveats. And we also heard from the Sierra Club about their message testing. That was to get us to this point where we can think about, we have some background information, we have uh, built up our vocabulary a little bit, now let's learn about the work that's being done on the ground, how challenging and difficult it is, but where the opportunities lie as well, and how we may be able to plug in. I love how this turned into, in part, a here's what research uh, researchers can do, here's what may be needed uh, to help move the needle forward. Because at the end of the day, there are many uh, who signed up who are academics, who are the kind of academics that I like to you know, put in air quotes, get it, that we're not just doing work in the academy to talk to five other academics who similarly care about the issues that we care about, that we want to, because we get to choose the questions that we ask, do research that has relevance to the work that's being done by advocates like you all on the ground so that we can actually help produce that change that we want to see. Uh, this is the start of what I hope is an ongoing conversation because the work that you all have been doing, um, you all are vets and I think uh, you all see the time horizon of the work ahead and it's not short. And so to the extent that we and others can continue this conversation, um, you know, in the common purpose of moving the needle forward to better protecting uh, climate displaced persons, then my center will definitely be a home for that, uh, or at least another place for that. So for Ama, for Kaylee, for Denise, for your respective organizations, thank you so much for your, not just participation today, but also your partnership in working with my center and working with the MASA group in ensuring that what we were producing was in alignment with the broader objectives uh, that folks in this space share. Uh, so with that, I thank everybody for sticking it out uh, for four panels uh, throughout the day. I thank you all for your continued work. And with that, we will wait for the next chapter, hopefully sometime soon. So thank you all very much. <laughs>